is a panel on collaborative consumption. So if this is why you're here, um, just come over and listen, I guess. Um, I don't want to do um, a big intro, just um, maybe two words on what collaborative consumption is. I'll do a quick intro of our speakers and then we'll dive right in and we'll have time for questions afterwards. Um, so collaborative consumption is is a term that was coined um, probably in the 70s, but really championed by Rachel Botsman in her book, uh, What's Mine is Yours. And it's basically about sharing um, goods and services um, with other people, basically. Um, we have some of the companies that I would name as examples of collaborative consumption here today, such as um, Airbnb, um, car or ride sharing companies, uh, such as Zipcar in the US or DriveNow in Germany. Um, or Gitsi to name another Berlin um, example. Um, I'm, my name is Celine and I'm co-founder of Kipoko, which is a task uh, swapping platform. So we're also in that space. Um, so let me do a quick intro of the speakers. Um, we have Heiner to my, to my left, um, who's community manager at um, Airbnb in Germany. I don't think I need to explain what Airbnb does. <laughs> Um, then we have Joel, who's a co-founder of Desk Wanted, um, a platform for basically booking um, desks and co-working spaces. Um, then we have Katie, who's the community manager at um, Gitsi, a platform to book experiences. And finally, Dan, a uh, co-founder at Kinderfay, um, which allows parents to find childcare. Um, so let's just get started. You have a mic. Um, so I just did a very quick intro, but maybe you can explain a bit more in depth what uh, collaborative consumption is all about for you. Just whoever wants to. Yeah, can you? Hello? It's working? Okay. <laughs> hey everybody, I'm Heine. Uh, for me, collaborative consumption is to get access to stuff you don't basically own. So like Airbnb, we, you get access to rooms, accommodations you usually couldn't get access to. So you can book a very nice apartment in San Francisco or like car sharing. You don't have to own a car, you can just rent it. For me, collaborative consumption is just get what you want by not having it. So that's basically for me what collaborative consumption is. Granted, um, I'm more about sharing workspace. Um, I would say the, um, uh, the, the, the term for me really is all about allowing people to access one-on-one uh, -on -one products and services that have previously been the domain of a really big corporation or a big company or have been inaccessible for whatever means. So we weren't really able to swap one-on-one -on -one these uh, sort of small scale products and services and, and now we're really finding ways using online platforms to break that down and really democratize the idea of, um, uh, of, of, of consumption and, and production and allow you to basically exchange one-on-one -on -one, um, without the interface of a really big um, you know, corporation that dictates all the terms about what that product is or what it should be. It allows you to do whatever it is that you do and uh, offer it to somebody else um, in, in a really open way, and it's not, I mean, it's, of course, it's actually a, a reverse, a regression to an earlier kind of market that we used to have, which was a really simple one-on-one -on -one type market, but we're using, um, we're using online platforms to do it, so that's what makes it unique and new. Yeah, so hi, I'm Katie. Uh, I work at Gibsy. Um, yeah, I think I agree with uh, what everyone said. I don't think many of us are going to disagree with each other. But just touching on uh, what Joel said, for Gibsy, um, we're a place where you can book and offer experiences. And I think what he said about challenging more like traditional ways of offering something, uh, Gibsy definitely does that in, I guess, the experience um, marketplace. So, for example, I don't know, more traditional ways to book tours or experiences. Now Gidzi makes it easy for anybody to be uh, a local guide or to offer an experience and anybody can find these rather than sort of having to find maybe randoms when you're on vacation. It makes it a lot easier and a lot more trustworthy. Um, and then I also think that it, it, collaborative consumption now uh, really enables, I guess, new ways of creating community too. Uh, online, you're meeting new people, you know, having real experiences together, sharing things. Um, with people that I guess in the old model used to be your neighbors and, and people that you knew from your 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 communities now it's online um, yeah 
Hey guys, my name is Dan. Um, for me, I mean, yeah, the, the, the definition is pretty clear. It's sharing something that already exists. So instead of buying something, you share something. And, and as Katie said, in the past, maybe you used to know your neighbor a lot better. 30 years ago, you knew all your neighbors, and you'd share their saw, you'd go over to borrow the drill, and now you just don't know your neighbors anymore. So you need an online platform to, to share, and obviously that makes the market a lot more liquid. All of a sudden, in your street, there's definitely someone that has a saw, even if none, none of the people in your house has one. And at, at Kinderfe, it's not so much about sharing goods, it's more about sharing connections. So we're an online marketplace for childcare, and what that means is once we have, on the one hand, we have a big community of, of childcare givers, so that's nannies and babysitters, and on the other hand, we have parents, but every parent that joins our community brings their child caregivers. So everyone brings their favorite babysitters. So instead of having access to only your limited set of, of caregivers, you now have access to all of your friends' caregivers as well. Do you want to add something? Or? Okay. Um, there, there are very different platforms that are kind of in this space of collaborative consumption. Um, I mean, for example, for, there's a big difference, obviously, between car sharing and, and ex Gitsi, for example, your big experiences. So if, if these companies all belong in the same space, what are kind of the common denominators and what are the motivations for people to engage in such different services? Yeah. I, I think the, the real similarities are the way that the platform works. It's that it's a marketplace that makes people find other people with similar interests and sort of one person has something, the other one person needs that. So whether it's a car, whether it's a flat that's free, whether it's a babysitter, whether it's someone that books a tour, the sort of mechanics are the same and the same problems exist. So how do you make the marketplace liquid? How do you make sure everyone can find someone that's really of interest to them? How do you make sure the people on the platform are trustworthy and actually deliver the service they promised? So I think all, all four of us have a, that exact same problem despite having being in completely different sectors of the economy. Um, sharing my car, my apartment, my babysitter, or whatever. Um, that's a lot of sharing. Where is this kind of going? Um, do you think that people will completely let go of possessions? Um, is, there, is there a way in the middle? Or, yeah, what's your view on that? Well, I think for sharing, there always have to be people who own stuff. There, there has to be people who own cars. There has to be people who own flats to share it. So I don't think that everybody going to not own anything. It's just like everybody is. I think pretty much everybody will share something, but not everything. Like for me, I never have a car, never had to, and I never will. But I always going to have my own apartment because I want to feel home. Airbnb is kind of like home and you can feel at home there, but still I want the place. So I'm thinking, or I, I think that people will always have stuff and there has to be people who own stuff. So it's not going to go all the way that everybody is sharing everything. Yeah, I think I definitely agree. And we can, we can also see that on our platform, we see that some parents are really reluctant to share. So some people just want to use the network and other people are more willing to give. And yeah, I, I don't think that the idea, of the idea of possession has been around for such a long time. I don't have the feeling that the internet's going to change that. I don't know if you know, but Airbnb in Germany did a study this summer that proved that it's not just a trend like such in the US, people in Germany really do it because it's the way they think changed. People now don't want to own stuff, they're happy with having access to stuff and we proved that so uh, it's going to go more, we're going to start uh, sharing more but it's not going to be that everybody shares. There's still going to be some people who are totally rich and just do it because they can save time or can save a little bit money. They just focus on their own stuff, but they're start. They're gonna be people who start thinking that they're gonna save the environment. They're gonna help the environment. So I'm thinking, or I know that people right now um, <coughs> gonna share more because they know they're gonna 
do something good for the environment, but it's not going to be that everybody going to do it. Uh, if you're talking about the potential direction of, um, of where this is going and where it could end up, I think what we're going to see is um, more things that are done offline, done online, and they're going to be done in, this, uh, the plat in the way that the platforms that we're seeing currently, that that's the, the method that it's going to be done. You're going to see every type of potential transaction that's done currently in the real world on a physical basis is going to be transferred eventually to the, to the digital world. And um, the, the most common platform that's going to be used is one that lets you know who the other person is and lets you interact with them on a very intimate level. So um, I see the whole thing being broadened out to every type of interaction and every type of transaction imaginable. Um, and I, all the time I hear about little ways in which um, concepts which you would think are just purely offline are being digitized. And it's just never going to end. It's, it's, you'll, you'll never be cease to uh, be amazed at uh, how someone is thought to capture a certain interaction on, in an online platform. And we're only, we're only going to see more and more of that. Um, and so I really think that um, uh, we're just at the start. And I guess even within the, uh, the space that we're talking about, like talking about the transactions we already do online in these collaborative models, um, I'm already starting to see a lot of diversity between all the different models and platforms. So for instance, within the online accommodation platform, of course, Airbnb is the, um, you know, the, main, the main one that everyone recognizes. But under that, we're also starting to see this splintering of little like, niche groups of people who share their flats and apartments in different ways. You know, there's one called Startup Stay, which is for entrepreneurs who want to share their flats together. And well, if you can get that niche already, how much further is it going to go? We're going to start seeing every type of small community be able to interact on a really intimate level. Um, so I think that what we're looking at right now is really just the, um, the very beginning of it. So you would say that we're going towards um, kind of a hyper-fragmented market of collaborative consumption platforms, a niche for everything, basically? It could be, but um, as we also know, in, on, in the digital world, um, digital markets tend to trend towards monopolies. Um, and so it, it does make it difficult. And um, so I think we might see some of these small platforms kind of shoot up and then maybe die away. Because that's the other thing to re realize is that not every collaborative consumption platform actually works. A lot of them fail. A lot of them don't find a viable business model and they disappear after a couple of months of, you know, everyone getting excited about the idea of swapping this one thing that we never considered we could have swapped. But um, people are going to keep going to try and one of them is going to stick eventually and they will, they will, you know, go on and continue. Um, you kind of touched upon that a little bit, but um, so the, the internet kind of in, enabled this whole renaissance of sharing, if you want. Um, what, is, what is the role of mobile um, in, this, in the future of collaborative consumption? I think, it's a, I think the, the question is, wh what is the future of mobile in general? And I think in three or four years' time, everything will be mobile. Uh, I, if we look at our revenue projection at the, at the moment, 95% of our revenue is, is from our web browser. Uh, product, and we think that in something like 12 or, or 18 months time, about 95% of our revenue will be on mobile, because it just simply is so convenient. Of course, for us, it's it's a little bit different from from, for example, Airbnb or Gitsi, because or even Desk Wanted, because with us you typically book the same caregiver. So what Uber has done or what my taxi have done is that uh, it's just so convenient to do it mobile. I mean, if you're booking a holiday, I don't know if that's a or if you're looking for an office space for your company, I don't know if that's something you do on the fly while you're sitting in the, in the tram. Um, but, but I think mobile is really going to take off. And of course, with mobile, you have a lot of different possibilities that you don't have in a web platform. It can be real time. It can be real interaction. It can be location based. I mean, there's just so much new opportunity. And, and I think the, the sort of the where collaborative consumption online is today is really just a start. I mean, you see someone has an idea, why couldn't we share this? Why couldn't we do this together? And, and if you see, we're, we're four completely different sectors of the economy, and there's so much room in between our companies that I'm sure there's so much more to come. What are for you some of the main drivers and obstacles of collaborative consumption? Um, I think uh, it's, it's that. I mean, some people have, people have to get turned on to the idea, right? Like, 
of sharing and, and, and sharing experiences and sharing flats and sharing desks and, and, and interacting with these new communities that hadn't existed before. I think that's probably one of the biggest obstacles. And I think that, that it, it just, it's possible that people will obviously, like it, it works, it's proven to work, but it depends on your niche. So for Gidzi, I guess it's just turning people onto the idea that there's a place where you can go if you're bored and you want to find something to do. You can go online and there's really cool stuff that you wouldn't normally find. And I think that, uh, I mean, the same thing for finding childcare. Like, you wouldn't necessarily know that you, there's a website for this. People go, I don't know, Craigslist or something or call their friends. And same with Desk Wanted. Um, and I think that it requires a, a, a lot of social proof probably to get people onto the idea. Like, my friends are doing it or this person is doing it or it's in the media, so maybe I'll give it a try. I think that's probably the biggest challenge is, is getting this information out there and then having enough weight behind it that people are like, oh, yeah, this, this is kind of awesome. Maybe I'll try it for myself. And the driver, I mean, I think we're just, we have so much stuff and I think we're in a, in a lot of trouble just as society. Like, we have all this crap and so now I guess uh, like the opportunity is to is to find a way to make it so much more sustainable, you know, whatever, save the environment, share a desk, uh, or share a car, or something, um, or yeah, I don't know, share your saw. Like the, this is the, the these drivers are there. I think you just have to kind of be turned on to the fact that there are communities out there for people that really want to to, to participate in these sort of uh, yeah things. Um, I see there are some obstacles and um, I guess there are two different categories. One, uh, one is to do with um, the comfort level that people have and addressing that and also then to do with um, the regulation of these things. So um, to do with the way that people actually approach these services, um, I still think there needs to be some development in products to do with things like insurance and um, uh, personal, um, what's the word? reputation so that people really feel that they're comfortable doing there I mean we're all we're all used now to doing uh, to sharing a flat or something like that but um, uh, the, as these these uh, platforms develop we're going to be getting more and more intrusive into areas that we hadn't perhaps considered that we may let other people in and um, we will need to find ways to feel more comfortable about that I mean on a really basic level for instance at desk wanted we want to encourage every single office to become a shared office. So we think every office in the world can somehow be shared, just in the way that co-working spaces are shared workspaces. So our mission is to tell people who run offices that you should accept strangers to come into your office. Now you'd think that with something like Airbnb out there that that wouldn't already be that hard, but it still is. You know, it still is difficult to convince people that um, that your workspace or your workplace is something somewhere you can invite a stranger into. Um, and I've had a lot of people request some really bizarre kind of insurance products or things that they would want to have um, attached to our platform before they feel comfortable about it. Um, or some kind of verification process of who the people are. Um, and I thought all those things were already there in place. You know, you can see who they are, you can see their Facebook connections, you can see their... But there's still, there's still a degree of, of comfort that people need to overcome. And I think particularly in the corporate sphere. So, okay, on the personal level, we're all pretty comfortable with these ideas, but when you get start dealing with companies, even like small companies, suddenly you hit another kind of level of of, um, of intrusiveness and, in, in, and and regulation to, to overcome. I mean, I'm talking mostly about our sphere at Desk Wanted, so that's a kind of one level of it. And the other level of obstacle um, is regulative. So I've spoken about this before, but there's a big problem in Germany with the um, with the agency called BaFin or the um, the financial regulation agency, which actually has made it illegal to run the kind of platforms that we all want to run. Well, not the platforms, but the payment mechanisms that we all want to run. The kind of mechanism where you pay a platform 100% of the cost, and then the platform keeps a percentage, and then pays the host or whoever's offering the service or the good, the remaining whatever, 90% of the, of, the, of the income. That's illegal for a German company to do now, according to BaFin which makes a huge problem for any startup that's based here that wants to pursue a collaborative consumption model based on that kind of, that kind of revenue uh, structure. Now, there are some companies that are trying to address this by doing, finding loopholes and basing payments uh, offshore, but if, there's, if, if the German um, authorities would actually wake up a bit and realize that they're missing the potential for a huge startup growth just because of their regulative practices and their, their regulation, then um, it would certainly make things go a lot faster, especially in Germany. Uh, the other option is that we'll ha all have to move our companies out of Germany, which would be really unfortunate. Yeah, the, I think the Baffin topic is really annoying for everyone. It, it, technically, it's not, e it's not necessarily illegal, but you need a banking license because you're handling someone else's money. 
Uh, there's a couple of loopholes that I guess all of us have in our terms, terms and services, but it's, it's a bit annoying to spend money on a lawyer when you want to spend money on your product. Um, but I think that's something that's very specific to Germany. I think something that we see that's, that's typical for collaborative consumption platforms all around the world are awareness that you said, and the other thing, what you call um, comfort, we call it trust. Yeah. So every, every platform has trust barriers. So for example, for us, it's the parents need to trust the babysitter, and the babysitter needs to trust the parents. And, and every sort of collaborative consumption marketplace has that, because you're, you're dealing with strangers, and who are they, and will you get your saw back, or will you not get your saw back? Will your car have a scratch? Will it not have a scratch? What will happen if the car has a, stra a scratch? So all of these topics are sort of in, in, in the process of being solved by a lot of platforms. And I think at the moment, everyone is solving the problems that is very specific to their niche. So we're trying to solve that for childcare, car rental uh, platforms are trying to solve that for car rental places, and Airbnb has a huge uh, um, insurance that they have when, when, when someone breaks your flat. But, but it's even more fundament that fundamental and something breaking because someone's really inside your house. So. Um, going back to the question of the drivers, um, the, the growth of um, collaborative consumption also coincides with an economic downturn, right? And we can observe, for example, that in some of the southern European countries that are struck by the crisis, um, especially offline solutions um, are created by the people themselves without making it necessarily a company. So what, what, what's, what's going to happen once the, the economic situation gets better? Is it is that something that might slow down the growth of collaborative consumption because people will need it less, or will it not have an impact? I, I don't think so. I, d I don't think that the economic downturn or people having less money is the major driver for us. If you look at the four companies, okay, maybe having a sharing office space is maybe about saving money, but even then it's more about having an experience and being in someone else's office and sharing knowledge. People sp I, I recently read a study about Airbnb that people that stay in San Francisco with Airbnb, spend more money on average than people that stay in hotels. S and, and for us, babysitting is not about saving money, and for Gitsi, doing a tour is the same. So, so I really don't think so. I think the big driver for us is that you don't know your offline community as well as you maybe did 20 or 30 years ago. And, and you're more willing to have a bigger community. Yeah, well, I, would, I would agree. That with definitely with, uh, with, with co-working and workspace sharing, um, it was something that has been helped along by um, uh, by the fact that people were suddenly found themselves as freelancers or needed to find some place to work outside of the traditional office. But it's certainly not going to go away if, uh, and that's a big if, any there's an economic return. I mean, I don't think there's any, you know, light on the horizon yet. It seems like an endless cycle of crises, one after the other. So I don't think. Uh, even so, even even if it was the case, people have really got the idea in their heads that things don't have to be done the old-fashioned way, and we can do things differently. So, um, I, th I don't think it's a problem at all. Um, I recently read an article that was entitled "Collaborative Consumption: A Trend for the Young, the Hip, the Urban." Um, now we kind of touched upon the idea of a trend. What about what about the young young and urban part of that statement? Um, do you think that collaborative consumption is really for young and urban people? I mean, right now that's kind of what we can observe. Is that going to change? It's, is it a solution that's going to be for the whole population in a couple of years? You can maybe just talk about that. I guess it's because it's maybe an online thing, and, and younger people are more. Uh, I guess. Uh, willing to accept new things that are happening on the internet, especially since the majority of this stuff is, yeah, happening online, it's happening on mobile. I, I don't know what you guys' demographics are like, but mine, I, I guess with Gitsy, it's a, it's a whole mix of people, though. It's not just young people that are using Gitsy, it's old people, it's, it's everybody. Um, but I think that, I guess, they're, they're, uh, they're uh, whatever that word is, uh, p pigeonholing, I guess, a collaborative consumption for being just with the young and urban people. It just makes sense because people that live in, urban centers that are younger probably have internet access and are probably reading what's going on and maybe are a little bit more, I guess, aware of these trends and stuff. Uh, that, that's my guess. Yeah, I think so too. I think it's more about these are the first users, but I don't think that collaborative consumption is about being young. I mean, my dad loves Airbnb. I don't, I don't know what your user demographics are like, but my dad loves it and a lot of older people I speak to love it as well. My, uh, a lot of the babysitters on our platform are retired kindergarten teachers and they love using it, it's not a problem for them. 
So, so yeah, I don't think it's about being young. Maybe urban, because obviously when there's more stuff happening closer to where you are in the local marketplace, it makes more sense, but. And wh what about geographic um, impact of your geographic location? Um, is collaborative consumption um, really a global phenomenon? Are all countries made equal in that sense? Um, or do you observe differences in the way people approach collaborative consumption, how open they are to it, what they are ready to share and what not? Um, yeah. We're only in Germany, so yeah. get, get to Airbnb, you guys go for it. Yeah, I mean, we, the, I guess uh, we launched in Germany, so our, our communities have sort of, it, it's been like a network effect from where we sort of started and where our own networks are. That's sort of the answer. Like, people are really into the idea, but I guess uh, you ha the, what I talked about, about social proof and stuff, like if there are not really big communities in other areas where people really want to start a Gidzi community, it's sort of hard to, to kickstart something by yourself. So it's easy for us to, to see uh, people grasping the idea in Germany because we launched here, and same in Amsterdam because our founders are Dutch, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, I, was, I think um, a lot of that collaborative consumption is about breaking barriers that existed. So b barriers to exchange things or barriers to access things. Um, and some of that is a barrier that was existed, existed because of a lack of access to be able to interact with people. But there are other barriers in other parts of the world that are created by other factors, like such as interference or, or like one company dominating one sphere. So I would imagine you'll, you should start to see um, uh, opportunities emerge where people are trying to resist a certain barrier to access one-on-one uh, -on -one interaction or, or transaction with somebody. So it's probably not so much, uh, you know, of course it's wherever the internet is, but that's pretty much everywhere now. Um, and uh, so it probably should look for the places where it's difficult to do something with somebody else for whatever reason, because you don't know them or because something's in your way. So there's no reason why it shouldn't be uh, accessible or, or effective anywhere uh, where there's a barrier to stopping you actually do the thing that you want to interact with somebody else to do. Yeah, I totally agree. I think uh, <coughs> at the beginning it's easier to do collateral consumption in big cities but uh, pretty much it's possible everywhere. You can do it in a village, you can do car sharing in a village, so uh, it's not geographic. You can do it everywhere. Um, what about Berlin as a city to start a collaborative consumption startup? I mean, Gitsi started um, in Berlin. You folks are all, except for you, are based in Berlin. Um, is there something special about Berlin in that sense? Any reason why you started here? Well, I'm from Hamburg, but I'm. <laughs> but um, I think Berlin's a very uh, special town because it's very international. Um, it's very easy. It's very hip. Like you said already, it's uh, collaborative consumption might be just for hip people, but it's for a start for collaborative consumption. Berlin is a very good town to start a business to do collaborative consumption. Uh, we started because this is where. The majority of co-working spaces were when we launched in uh, two, two or so years ago. Other centers have now emerged, but we started here in response to the number of co-working spaces in Berlin. Um, so we're very much um, inspired by what we saw going on in the city. Um, and of course, all the other trends that make it nice to live here. But um, I think Berlin's in danger of losing that if, um, if uh, it's allowed to continue in the, the part that we're seeing, which is rents increasing ridiculously. and um, uh, and prices going up, and, and that's a lot of the function of the city government. Um, I think the city government could do a lot more to make sure that it stays an affordable place. Uh, for some bizarre reason, the mayor seems to think that it would be better if the rents were more expensive here. He seems to think it would attract a better type of citizenry, but um, he, I think he's openly said he wants this to be the new Paris um, and paying Paris rent prices, which if that's the case, then you could say goodbye to the entire startup infrastructure, which is entirely based on the idea that it's a cheap place to live. Um, so I think there could be a lot more done in the way of making sure that rents don't rise too quickly and there's certainly mechanisms that the government already has that it can use to make sure that people don't take huge advantage of, of rent prices. Uh, the other potential problem is, uh, again, in the, in the regulation of, of by BaFin. If, if BaFin, the BaFin issue isn't sorted out um, and, you know, if a decent workaround isn't found, then the startup, the startup uh, ecosystem here you know, is also under threat. So I don't think you should think it's take, take it for granted that this is always going to be here. It's here now because it's cheap and because it's relatively easy and there's, there's you know, 
uh, uh, an environment that allows it to happen, but, but that's always in flux. And um, so you've got to kind of protect it and uh, make sure that it doesn't, um, doesn't swing the other way and turn us into a Paris where you can't do anything. That was, uh, that was intense. Um, <laughs> We started in Berlin because uh, this is where our founders lived. They had a, a, a design studio and then they decided to stay in Berlin and they had a big network here as we talked about. So it, was, it just seemed like a logical place to start. Uh, and I mean, we found the community in Berlin is super open to, um, to trying new things and meeting new people and sharing experiences. And maybe that's just because the people that I guess we're friends with in our network has made up a lot of expats or just really curious people. And I, I, I've only been in Berlin for a year and I found that everyone's just really open and willing to try new stuff. So I guess maybe that's why something like Gidzi really works. I think for us it's not so much about the customers because we have customers throughout Germany. It's more about Berlin is awesome and it's a great place to exchange ideas. So for us as the people that run the company, it's great to exchange ideas. I mean, do, you know, there are other uh, collaborative consumption platforms that you can exchange ideas with, that you can meet for a coffee, and you can, ex yeah, so. Um, with collaborative consumption being a lot about the people, people that offer something and, and the people that book or, or, yeah, exchange something in return, um, what is the specific role of community management in, in that setup? I mean. There's a reason that we have two community managers on the panel here. Um, so maybe this is more a question for you guys. Um, what are the specifics of community management in collaborative consumption? Um, is it more important than in other startups? Um, and what are kind of the, the important aspects of it? Yeah, well, I mean, um, I guess maybe I can sort of talk about, I think the importance of community management, it depends on the company that you're working for. So ours was built as a community first a community first platform, it's a community marketplace. So obviously community management is incredibly important to us. Um, we need to, like we want people to, to, to host their experiences on Gidzi. And so I think it's really important to have sort of a mediator, which is myself, in between making sure that these people are supported and they feel like encouraged in their activities and they, they, they can look really good on their website, quality control sort of thing. And then also being a bridge between the people that are booking activities and also the company sort of putting out our idea of what we want Gidzi to be, the people that we want to be using Gidzi, showing that the, the platform is extremely flexible for anybody to, to use. Yeah, I think, like, uh, in collaborative consumption, I guess, since it is also a very community-driven sort, of, uh, sort of thing, uh, community management is really important, but I think it's mostly about the, it's mostly about the company. Um, and yeah, Gidzi specifically is, is, is a community-first uh, startup, so that's why it was important. Yeah, for Airbnb, community management is a very important part because uh, our product is based on trust and reputation. And people who want to, or who are sharing their apartment, really want to know who is working for the company and really want to meet us. And that's why we go out to the, meet, uh, to the people and bring these people together so they can share their ideas, their, uh, yeah, pretty much their ideas. So community management for Airbnb is like one of the important parts. So it's, it's about connecting the users, but it's also connecting the company to the people, right? To your users. Yeah, it's like our community, like the people, who, the host and the guest, they meeting offline. At first they meet online, then they meet offline. But still, they want to know who's a, who's a company. Most people don't know how big Airbnb is, and they are, oh, you're in Hamburg, oh, you're in Berlin, you're in Munich. So for them, it's really important to know who's running the company, who's working for the company, to ask questions, because there are a lot of questions if you're a host on Airbnb, so it's very important for us to go outside, to go to our community. I think sharing is all about people. So if you have shitty people on your platform, you're a shitty company, and you have awesome, if you have awesome people on your, on your platform, you're an awesome company. So I think the, the main thing that we do in our community management, we try to get rid of the people that we don't like and have more of the people that are awesome. And we found that if we have awesome people, they attract other awesome people. And if we have people that are sort of not quite so awesome, they attract other people that are not quite so awesome. So if you, if you have one guy that has made a lot of money cheating on eBay, he'll attract his friends to try to do the same thing. So when you see something that, that's not 100% correct on your platform, you need to act immediately. And that's, that's what we do with our community management. So we try to give examples how to behave in a good way and, and, and make everyone feel you're part of that. Okay. Um, one last wrap-up question. Um, 
So we have, we, we're sharing cars, we're sharing rides, we're sharing apartments, experiences, desks, etc. cetera. Um, what's the next kind of thing, big thing? What's, what's missing? What are we not sharing yet that we should be? I think you can share everything. Yeah. I mean, any, any, uh, anything that you can hold in your hand or any service you can share. Except maybe for your toothbrush, I mean. Yeah, I agree. Sharing is caring. I think everybody sort of, everyone knows that, for sure. I, I think that there's also potential to share. I don't know if there's like a platform missing. Like, I can't really think of something that's like, what's what's not there? But, but I'm sure that there's something, but I don't know what the basic things that I need. Maybe like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Um, last time we were on a panel together, there was someone from the audience who asked a question, and I thought it was really appropriate and I think accurate. And they said, why is there no meta search engine that combines the different forms of sharing so that you can have like a package experience so you can travel somewhere and book a bed and then book an experience and then book your co-working space all through sort of one uh, meta platform so i think we might see a few of those emerge now yeah. and i think there's a, a a couple of software companies that are working on tools that they then sell to all collaborative consumption platforms for, for example there's Credport. they're a platform where you can where you can upload all your uh, the credentials that you've collected on, on one of the platforms. And when you join an, a new platform, people already know that you're responsive, that you don't have any bad reviews on the other platform. So I think there will be a lot of stuff happening in that space that's sort of more infrastructure. Yep. Okay, good. Well, thanks a lot. Um, I guess we can take a couple of questions now if, if anybody wants to. I don't think we can pass this round. I got one simple question. Um, I think the point is obviously this whole collaborative consumption thing is like a startup thing right now, like grassroots, cool people doing cool stuff. And I only see one big point where big companies just trying to get there is that mobility thing because you know, drive now is BMW and stuff like that. And um, the question is, um, do you think that in future more companies will try to enter the market because on one hand, it's not in their interest because they want to sell stuff and they want to uh, sell stuff and don't want to share that. But on the other hand, it's a big market. So what do you think will maybe come? I think there's already a couple of big companies in the market. For example, in services, the, the big thing, I mean, the big trend in the last 10 years has been, uh, I don't know the English word, but it's Zeitarbeit. So, so, so in a certain sense, that is a type of collaborative consumption as well, although it doesn't have the best image. Um, I, 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 I don't know so much about the other sectors that are not services, but at least in the services sector is already a big thing, and the, the services sector is huge. So I, I, I mean, when there's a lot of money to be made, I'm sure that there will be a lot of big companies that will look at the opportunities in the space. Yeah, I agree with that. I'm sure more people, if the, if the, if the model sort of works and they see that there's a, the, the potential there, I'm sure a lot of people will probably come into the space. And also, I guess we're seeing some of the startup people, the cool kids, like Airbnb, are becoming the bigger companies that are, that are gonna be, I guess, in, yeah, the big guys that are gonna rule the, the school of collaborative consumption. I think the limitation, though, is that um, the experience has to be somewhat personal. You know, the reason that, that it's so great to do these things is because you get to meet somebody at the other end. So you go to a co-working space, you meet the person who runs it. You go doing a tour, you meet the person who does the tour. Um, and that's the limitation that a big company has. They can't have a personal experience with every single one of their customers because they're big. Um, so, you know, you're not going to be able to break down every service that a big company does to the micro level where you can have sort of a one-on-one -on -one interaction with the person who made the thing or does the thing. Um, big companies might try and get in at, at the level we're at, the platform level, to actually run the, the interaction between the two people. But if it's not two people swapping ideas, services, products, or you know, whatever, then um, there's not so much that a big company can do, except try and sit on top of that and take a percentage. One thing mentioned was uh, you have to divide um, good and bad 
use, users into groups you, because you only want to have the good ones and not the bad ones. What do you think about uh, tools or programs uh, to measure uh, the influence in the virtual reality of a user, like cloud or something similar? In Germany, it's not so popular. And it's cross-platform. What do you think about cross-platform user influence? Yeah, I, I think cloud cloud is a good example. I think it would be the wrong tool because cloud is about the influence you have and not about how reliable you are. But there's similar things that are being established like Credport where it's, it's really similar to cloud only it's for, for reliability. And I think at the moment all of us, we all have spent an incredible amount of time writing our own algorithms, trying to find out someone registered for a site like on the first day, how reliable are they going to be by trying to figure out how, how quickly do they respond to the first email, how quickly do they respond to the first request? How do they respond after the first job has taken place? And, and then you try to judge sort of, are they going to be a good service provider for the next 100 days that they're going to provide a service for? And yeah, I, I, th I think if something that was good and cross-platform that existed, that would be incredibly good. Yeah, for sure. I mean, trust is super important for everything that we're doing. So if there was a way for us to be able to show that someone is super trustworthy, then If someone would come to you and ask you, uh, will you uh, do any effort into that business uh, bring in and uh, develop it uh, with uh, your company, would you do that or not? I can speak for Ken if you but definitely. I mean, we sell trust. We sell the interaction between two people that don't know each other. So anyone that's, that has a great product in that space, we're definitely willing to work with them. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't actually say yes or no on behalf of Gibbsy, but it sounds really awesome. Yeah. <laughs> no other questions? Okay, well then, thanks a lot for listening, and thanks a lot for coming to you guys.